Eadim, a rifle and sword adventure. Chapter 5, The Principality of Tyrian. Written by Sir Hack 72. Iris snuggled herself by the blanket while holding a cup of a special brew that the UFE call hot chocolate with marshmallows. Whenever she was in the verge of crying, Dr. Lee Hanuel told her to take a sip of the hot chocolate, and if she needs to distress herself she can always chew on the pillow soft marshmallows to gnash her canines to. While the vampire which was kept from wailing loudly with her provided comforts, Colonel Polonsky and Strider group were gathered next to a table across the room. Well this just got worse, and I thought Iris will be such a good help. Rose, so these, burning horse bandits are not only the people who burnt Iris home but were also the people we fought before with the flame golem? Polonsky asked. It was confirmed. Samantha answered. And judging from the accounts we got from Iris, they are bad news. Arson, murder, and horrible street art. These people sound very much they need to be stopped. Polonsky said while reviewing the notes he has obtained about Glyasia on the table. So, what happens now Colonel? Crocker asked. Well without the books to give us our needed knowledge of this place we'll have to do this the old-fashioned way and just walk up and map up the land. Mudwin I want your drones to be ready to conduct a geological survey of the area near the city of Tyrian. Polonsky said. Tyrian? Samantha asked. It is a city that Iris has mentioned about during our interviews with Hannah and I conducted. From what she said, it's a large walled city northwest from our settlement. Said to be home to the local ruler of this place. A Prince Clovich, by the name, his family, the Rians have been ruling over about everything within a 35-mile radius from his city. According to Iris, he is received rather contently for a 30-year-old leader. I want you to go scout out the city, upload me the survey data and await further instructions. Polonsky ordered. You are going to the city? Iris interrupted. Yes, how are you feeling Iris? Samantha asked. Better, thank you for the blanket and this medicine called, chocolate. I feel much better now. So, you are going to Tyrian? I can be your guide about the place. I have been to the city now and then to buy food and ingredients for my experiments. I do have some, um, errands, to do in the city. Iris said. Well, I don't want to have Strider Group go in completely blind and you ask nicely, very well. Iris shall accompany you to Tyrian as auxiliary support. Now pack up as much gear as you can fit on your cruiser because this mission could take a few days to complete. Dismiss. Polonsky raised his voice. Strider Group saluted to their CO. And moved out. On the road to Tyrian. So, guys, when the two began to have their romantic night under the sun, I snuck up behind them by a cliff against the wind. I can practically see from above the male on top of her ready to make some babies when I lined up by rifle and bam. Got both of them in one shot. You should have seen the look on their faces, they looked like they were caught mid-orgasm. The taxidermist couldn't stop laughing at the trophy after he did his thing with it. Obedia said, storytelling his most memorable hunt to the squad while they sped through the road. You're so naughty Obed, I thought you hillbillies were conservatives. But no, you snuck up on the midsex and shot them. Samantha laughed. Is that even legal? Vincent asked. That's pretty rich coming from you. Samantha said. Oh, for real lieutenant? You said naughty and from my experience, the way you said it is the same on how a hooker would say, you have been a naughty boy, dot. Vincent mocked in his best, seductive woman's accent. Kane, Iris and Crocker couldn't help but chuckle at the story Obedia had shared. Without the luxury of the internet and television yet they had to rely on storytelling to keep themselves entertained in the road. Some of the stories that group shared were ranging from funny to the bizarre. It started with Samantha's first attempt on trying to cook an omelette for her dad during Father's Day, but ended up causing her to call the fire department because she almost burned down her family's house down. Crocker's story was during a time in his college years where he was hazed by his fraternity mates by streaking naked around the campus, while his friends were pelting eggs at him. For Kane, he told the story where he had become a victim of a Japanese variety show prank. 
Then there was Vincent who told the story of the time he snuck inside a fancy charity raffle and stole a sports car in front of the city's elites, whilst it the raffle was being drawn. Iris couldn't help but smile as she had heard those stories. Kane had helped her by explaining several of the unfamiliar terms she had heard from them. She was still trying to grasp the English language she has acquired from the UFE, and if she can linguistically compare her mother tongue to English, they share several grammar settings and rules with the English language having new words that her old tongue didn't have a word for due to cultural and technological differences. Hey, how about her? She hasn't told us something about herself? Vincent asked the group. He pointed his finger at Iris, which caught the vampire in surprise. Me? But don't you hate me after I almost killed all of you? Iris asked trying to deflect Vincent's question. Well you are playing nice right now so we might as well play nice back. Do unto others what you want others to do unto you. So, let's forget that shit in your, um yeah not going there but you get the idea. Vincent said. Amen to that. Obedia praised. Come on Iris, we shared stories and you might as well share yours since you're with us now. Kane encouraged. Yes Iris, go share one. I don't want to be the odd one out for my woman's story. Got anything funny or interesting to say? Maybe about Glyasia or yourself? Samantha asked. Okay, not about myself but I can talk more about Tyrian. Iris answered. More intel the better vampy. Samantha added. Well, officially the name of the land we are in right now is, the Principality of Tyrian. It's a dominion of the Slegion Empire which rules from its capital Harringpoint. In exchange for protection, the Principality provides the Empire military access to its lands and the power to Levi men when the Empire goes to war. So, the Prince answers to this Slegion Empire? How big are we talking about? Samantha asked. From the northern mountains about a month's journey, to the southern rivieras that takes a week. The easternmost point of the empire is the capital that takes a fortnight to get to and from, and then Tyrian is by far the easternmost dominion of the empire. Iris explained. By far? Samantha asked. Its armies are expanding and conquering new territories. However, the northern mountains are a front for the Slegion legions because of the Scandinite barbarians from their island continent up north. So far that's the only place of trouble in the empire right now since all that is left eastward is uninhabited forests, and plains that nothing of interest is found, so no one would willingly go there unless they are part of trade caravan bound for the eastern kingdoms far away from here. Iris added. So basically, they are pretty fucking huge. Any chance we can go to Harring Point and drop by to say hello? Crocker asked. I don't think so. The Slegion Empire tends to be very defensive to foreigners even if they look human. Iris softly sighed. A sense of sadness and resentment from the vampire's face was painted on her head as she expressed her words. Okay then um, so we will be approaching Tyrian in a while. We should hide the cruiser by some trees and we can get to work. I will have to accompany you to the city to keep an eye on you for security reasons if you don't mind. Samantha asked. I don't I just need to withdraw some ducats from the bank. They are the empire's currency by the way. Iris said. Hey Sarge. I suggest you will want to take Diaz with you just to be sure. Oh, Crocker suggested. The criminal? Why? Samantha snapped, almost busting a nerve on her forehead. I am too conspicuous with my exosuit and LMG, plus Kane needs Obedia to assist him with the navigational equipment while he pilots the drone. Crocker argued. But what if he tries to run away? Samantha rebutted. I have nowhere to run to for crying out loud. Look I am practically just stuck here being bossed around by you lieutenant. I got no contacts, no stashes, no safe houses. All I got is the clothes on my back, my unique set of skill and this UMP. I mean people still make these? Vincent said. Hey, respect the classics man. It may not be a good at spitting bullets but there's reason why the SWAT still use that museum piece. Crocker said. Point taken from the Maori. Now stick your tongue out and scare me like the sergeant you are. Vincent teased. 
Crocker stuck his tongue out and wiggled it around his mouth causing the group to roar in laughter. Is this how you earth humans talk to each other? I wish I could have met you sooner. Iris chuckled. Yeah fine you can come with me and Iris if only just to make going to the bank a bit less tedious. Samantha spoke in defeat still resenting the ex-thief and silently cursing Colonel Polonsky. When she gets the chance, she will request that Vincent gets transferred to another squad so she doesn't have to suffer his manners of speech anymore. Inside TYR Rianne. The city was like something straight out of a fairy tale book according to Samantha. She can see hundreds of people, human people walk around the city going about their day-to-day -day business from merchants selling their wares to women fulfilling their chores, whilst making small talk with their neighbors. Sneaking a few shots of her camera in a careful attempt to not attract attention to herself, she discreetly snapshots from the covers of her jacket that have concealed her foreign gear and weaponry. Wearing a similar disguise, Vincent deeply inhaled the primitive but metropolitan air of the city. Ah, civilization or at least at its most based of states. I can hear the yelling of vendors, screaming, some town gossip, and, oh shit that dog over there just shit. Vincent said. Don't get distracted Diaz, we have a job to do. Iris lead the way. Samantha scolded before turning to the vampire witch. Iris curled her finger backward urging the two to follow her as they continued on their walk through the city. As they strolled past people, Samantha could hear the voices of the Tyrian residents talk to each other, not in a weird alien tongue but crisp clear English. Have you heard about the explosion in Wizards College back at the capital? Gossiped a young man who was conversing with another one. Mister can you please spare me a coin? An old beggar pleaded while he leaned on a wall. How much for this fine carpet of yours merchant? A rich looking man said in an attempt to haggle. Fresh vegetables. Get your fresh vegetables, said a middle-aged woman who was vending her farm's produce to the public for ducats. These voices besieged her causing her to suffer a migraine. She stopped in the middle of the pavement rubbing her forehead for relief. Iris paused her walking and softly moved to the red-headed and placed her hand behind her back. Is something wrong? Iris asked concernedly. I can hear everyone, in English, it hurts a bit. I can barely think and see straight. Samantha spokes. Me too. It feels overwhelming for me, hearing people speaking normally, as in our normal. Vincent commented. It's because I took the liberty of enchanting every one of your squad before we departed with a spell that allows you to understand us. I call it, the all tongue. You can hear us Glesians as if we were speaking in your language and when you speak to us it's the other way around. Iris explained. You cast a spell on us without telling us? Iris what the hell? You can't just do that. Samantha snapped. Why? I thought it would help you. I was told by Polonsky and Dr. Hannah to help you as your guide. Iris said shocked by the sudden tone coming from the lieutenant. Look Iris, we are still in a state of shock over this magic mumbo-jumbo that this place has and many of us are pretty damn scared of it. Samantha said. Why? Magic was a blessing from the gods to help the people of Glyasia thrive. Iris argued. Okay, first off I don't care about your religion right now Iris. Just please for our sake don't cast any of these enchantments on us without our permission. Samantha said. Fine, I promise. Iris sighed. Make that a swear vampy, just to be damn sure. Swear us and the rest of the squad that you won't cast any enchantments on anyone without their permission. Vincent added whilst he raised his hand. Following his gesture, Iris raised her hand to begin her oath. I swear to not use my enchantments on any one of the Strider Group soldiers. Make that anyone from the UFE. Please. Samantha interrupted. And to any of the U.F.E people that I. Iris Kadohagan the Vampire Witch. Vincent said. Iris Kadohagan the Vampire Witch have solemnly sworn to uphold. Iris finished her swearing. That's good to hear from you Iris. Now let's keep going. Samantha smiled. They continued to make their way through the city until they have reached metropolitan center of Tyrian which is the city square where many important buildings were found. 
Iris pointed at several significant buildings that Samantha noted, and took a sneaky photo of, such as the city hall where the principality discuss political theories and issues, the drunken bastard inn where they offer quality meals second only to the prince's own dinner table, the courthouse which houses the local branch of the Adventurers Guild where brave people ranging from mercenaries, heroic men and thrill-seekers seek jobs to bring peace and order throughout the land from dealing with bandits, caravan protection, and more. Finally, Iris then guided them to their destination, the Bank of Tyrian. It was a grand building with Roman-like inspirations for their outward aesthetics. It also was decorated by a few flowers that made the building inviting for those who wished to deposit their money inside. Well this it, just come inside with me and keep quiet. This will only take a while. Iris spoke. She pushed open the door and the trio went inside the bank. They were greeted in a welcoming environment with marble floors, potted plants and a warm fireplace. As they were about to move forward a voice thundered in front of them. Iris? Is that you again, said a small white bearded man in an elegant cloak. Greetings Luther, how is the city's greatest dwarven merchant doing? Iris smiled that Samantha saw as a sign that the vampire is in good terms with the dwarf. Oh, business is usual for me. I got to thank you for the exotic help in making that fire spewing axe for me. I made about 3,000,000 ducats in that auction. A new record. Who are those people behind you? Luthier responded. Oh, these are some mercenaries that I hired as protection while I do some. Which businesses if you know what I mean? Iris answered. Samantha could easily see through that lie whilst she stood still behind her. A secret job, huh? Well I don't want you to interrupt your business here in the bank. I heard what happened to your home by the way. If you're looking for ways to earn more ducats, I got some jobs I can show you at my house later. I just need to finish some paperwork here and we can discuss business. Luthia said. Let me withdraw from the bank and then we can talk. Iris smiled. Good to hear. Luthia smiled as he waved off the vampire. Who is that midget? Friend of yours? Vincent asked. Luthia Mirian, a dwarf merchant who lives here in Tyrian. The richest man in the city, even richer than the prince. Do dwarfs exist from your world? Iris replied. Depends, is dwarfism in Benham, three a race of people or a deformity? Samantha inquired. A race of people they are. They normally live on top of the mountain regions, but many dwarfs live in the lower lands to interact with others. What do you mean by dwarfism being a deformity? Iris asked in confusion. Well, some earth humans in our world are born abnormally short. Despite their parents being of average height. It happens now and then. Samantha answered. Are they discriminated for being small? Asked Iris. No, it's highly discouraged in our society to put down people of different height. Besides, most of the dwarfs we know from Earth tend to be actors and really great ones to boot. Samantha smiled. I would like to see these dwarfs of yours one day. Now please sit down by that bench and wait for me as I withdraw my money from the bank. Iris said. Samantha and Vincent turned around and sat down by the provided chairs of the establishment as they see their guide enter the waiting line to interact with the bank clerk. For Samantha, so far, she has observed Iris for her time with her and by her judgment, she is going out of her way to winning over her people's trust. She was not acting the same during their hostile first encounter earlier in her burnt-up home back in the forest. The lieutenant also has to give some credit due to Vincent Diaz for helping her make Iris promise or swear to not use her magic to affect them without their permission. She can see that the penal soldier knows how to double down on persuading people shrewdly, probably an acquired talent from his old underground career. The lieutenant watched the vampire slowly inching her way through the waiting line of the bank. Iris' posture was ladylike in stature that Samantha deeply admired from the angle. The vampire, combined with her beautifully youthful exterior was like a masterpiece waiting to be drawn, painted, or taken a photo of. Yet Samantha was unsure if she can even take a photo of her since vampires, or at least according to various sources from fiction writers, don't have reflections and her photo camera is no different from a mirror. 
After processing the thought of capturing the image of Iris, Samantha kicked up her feet and began to wait patiently again. As for Vincent, however, he has decided to pull out a cigar from his pocket and light it up with his lighter. Huffing carbon monoxide in the air he casually lay leaned back his arms and silently waited. That could kill you, you know? Samantha whispered. Mare. Vincent sighed. Silence and the occasional thumping sound of a stamp were the only noises that the bank could entertain their ears which has caused the two to get bored of the monotony of their predicament. Samantha aimed her eyes back at Iris and is amused to see her now right in front of the desk clerk of the bank ready to withdraw her ducats. Then just as she was about to get a big sack of her money, the grand doors of the bank have opened. Out came seven men who carried a large chest, and judging the look on the men's grunting faces, they were carrying a heavy one. She also noticed that each of the men all wore an orange-colored neck scarf, which is common attire for those who are associated with the burning horse bandits. Hey bank manager. Got another big money of totally legit earnings from our boss Devico. Said one of the bandits. A slender man in a business attire walked out of the desks and approached the bandits angrily. How many times do I have to tell you? I can't accept more of these large deposits of ducats anymore. The auditors are going to tear me apart when they ask me how your boss got this much money in such a short time. The bank manager pleaded. Look me in the eye. We got the entire principality in our fingertips and you think you can go against us. By any chance do you remember what you did in Temirun? Said the bandit connivingly. It was a sign that whatever this Temirun is, was enough leverage for the bank manager to comply in defeat as he stepped aside to the snake-like tongues of the burning horse bandits. Just as they were about to move their cargo to the bank's vault, one of the bandits, who Samantha assumes to be the leader of the group raised his hand to pause his troops. He turned his eyes towards the bank's desk and aimed them straight at Iris. Well, well. If it isn't the principality's resident which Iris Kadohagan. I want to get some feedback from you. How did you like our little redecorating art that we did to your house? The bandit sergeant smiled in a mockingly coy attitude. More like vandalism. I say I give it zero star rating. Iris answered back. You know you have been stubborn when paying our taxes so we had to give you some encouragement. Yet, you still say refuse. The bandit sergeant said. I have a life you know. I got more important things to do than to listen to the likes of you scum. Iris exclaimed. Ha. Ah. She said she has a life. Well, there is no point hiding it. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare Iris Kadohagan as a VA, the bandit sergeant was about to reveal Iris' secret to the bank customers and staff when Samantha interrupted him. Hands off my, client. Don't say a word. The lieutenant said as she pointed her rifle at the bandits. Boy. I recognize you, those weirdos we tried to raid from the Verdon Valley. You killed my brother in that raid on that refugee camp with the weird boat. Boys get her, the bandit sergeant commanded. The six bandits all charged forward with their weapons drawn at Samantha's direction. With her carbine, she let out a burst from her gun and managed to down three of the men. Also firing alongside her was Vincent who with his SMG got the bandit sergeant and two more of the burning horse thugs. LT look out! Vincent warned. The last surviving adversary who screened himself with the bodies of his comrade managed to get close to melee range. Samantha reacted quickly by backstepping but it was too close to leave her unscathed. The bandit stabbed Samantha's left leg with his dagger. If it wasn't for Sam's quick reaction she would have been struck to the stomach. Still not immediately realizing the wound she shoved the barrel of her carbine at the head of the enemy and discharged a bullet instantly killing him. The lieutenant fell on the floor panting for breath as she processed what she has done and the scenario at hand. She turned her eyes to the sharp pain on her leg. Damn it! Ah! Samantha cursed. She clutched her left legs wound with her hands and grind her teeth in a futile attempt to ease her pain. Miss Rose! Iris exclaimed. She ran towards the amber-haired lieutenant and knelt before her. Where's that fucking med gel? Vincent asked. Lieutenant Rose? This is Crocker. I heard your MIC give out gunshots. 
Respond. I what happened to you three? Are you all okay? Said Samantha's radio. It was the voice of Sergeant Crocker behind the device. Grabbing the portable radio from Samantha's chest rig, Vincent pressed the call button nervously and answered. This is Vincent. I mean Diaz. We got attacked by some of them burning horse bandits we all hate. Vincent answered still holding the call button. What the hell happened? Where's the LT? Asked Crocker concernedly. I am here. One of them stabbed me in the leg. Ah. Where's that goddamn medigil? Samantha yelled. Damn it. Patch her up. You got to get out of that place. Crocker barked. Vincent frantically probed the pockets of the lieutenant's chest rig for her medigel. His hands clumsily glided over her body as he desperately trying to find the healing implements. Don't touch me like that. Samantha protested Vincent's handling of her body. Well where the fuck is the medigel? Vincent shot back. Right abdomen, middle pocket, shit me. It stings. Samantha gnashed. Reaching for the designated area, Vince reached for the pocket and grabbed the medigel. It was a refillable spray device created to block off bleeding quickly. It is a vital item of any 22nd century first aid kit and it nearly killed the bandage industry. First shaking the spray prudently before use, Vincent sprayed the medigel at Samantha's wound as the lieutenant took deep but calm breaths. Can you get up LT? Crocker asked. Samantha, with the help of Iris picking her up limped her way to the door of the bank. Boy. I heard noises coming from the bank. This could be big lads. Said a voice behind the door. No, that's principality guards. Iris said. Shit the heat is coming down on a Sam. Vincent added. Samantha panicked over the thought of capture by hostile natives. She has feared that due to the fact she was a woman, she would be treated much worse if she was captured. Horror stories of rape, torture, and humiliation circled her mind. We can't get caught here, right here, and right now. We need to buy us some time to get out here. We need a distraction. Samantha said. A distraction? I think I got it. Learn this in prison breakout movies. Vincent eagerly jumped. He turned to the abandoned burning horse bandit's chest and pulled the heavy chest to the door. He opened the chest and brought out the sacks of gold housed inside. Whilst opening the sacks, Vincent opened the door where a crowd of curious onlookers stared at the strange man carrying sacks of gold from the financial institution. The bank has declared a massive refund on all accounts and those who have yet to open one. Here is some free money. Vincent yelled. He threw a handful of gold coins to the bystanders. The crowd rioted over the money being freely given away by the mysterious stranger as people fought amongst themselves to catch as much currency that their hands and pockets can hold. He repeatedly threw more coins at the populace which has caused a group of principality guards to trip over, and even try to loot some of the ducats themselves. Okay, we got time. Now what? Vincent asked turning to Samantha who was being attended by Iris. The vampire which felt adrenaline once again flow inside her as she began to initiate her instincts. She turned her eyes to her dwarf and friend Luthia. Luthia. Remember the times I have helped you acquire so many exotic goods when you overextended yourself in the deals you made with your clients. You told me back that I would return the favor to you one day. Dot. Iris asked the dwarf merchant. Luthier emerged from his hiding spot from under a table that he his child-sized stature can easily make use of as a place of concealment. The dwarf's expression was in utter surprise by the hunted words coming from his vampire friend. Yes. You want to pull that right now? Luthier asked. I need you to help me and my friends find a place to hide from the guards. Iris said. Friends? I thought they are your body. Just do it. Iris yelled. Of course. Follow me, I can take you three to my inn. The dwarf adamantly spoke as he stood up and gestured them to follow him. This is Vincent of Strider Group. Iris and a dwarf is leading us to a safe place. Vincent radioed. Say again, a dwarf? 
Crocker answered. This is Castle Lord. I got the sit rep from the second in command. How is Strider lead? Said Colonel Polonsky using his code name. Block the bleeding sir with some med gel. Sam should be okay. Vincent answered. He picked up Samantha and placed the weight of her body over by his back and sheathed his SMG by its bandolier. Affirmative, and may I remind you private that you must refer to your fellow soldiers by addressing their rank then last name. Said Polonsky. Yes, yes sorry. Vincent grudgingly apologized. He was not the type of person who does formalities. Good. Castle Lord out. Polonsky signed off. One grueling saddleback carry later. Ah, fuck my back. Vincent complained as he twisted and turned on the sofa that he rested on. He had to carry his CO through tight and dark corridors of the city whilst avoiding the eyes of the city's law enforcements. He had tripped several times due to the unmaneuverability of the alleys of TYR Rian. For him, it was like carrying a block of concrete blind while angry German shepherds were chasing him whilst running around for days. However, in reality, he had only been carrying Samantha for about 200 meters as they all didn't have to go too far from the bank to their hiding place. The drunken bastard inn which was situated not too far away from the city square was owned by Iris dwarf friend Luthia Mirian. Not only was the pint-sized businessman being has holdings in the mercantile aspects of the business world of TYR Rian, but he also has invested in real estate such as the inn that Lieutenant Rose, Private Vincent and Iris are currently hiding on. The rich dwarf was kind enough to give the biggest room in the inn for one night free of charge for Iris, due to the bed being both the largest and softest provided in the establishment. Samantha indulged herself inside the luxurious bed drifting to a limbo state of sleep and situational awareness. She feels so vulnerable in this state. She prayed that the city guard won't try to search the inn for the perpetrators of the dead burning horse bandits in the bank earlier that day. She has hoped that the beacon that she quietly activated will guide Crocker and the rest of the squad to their location. Iris, as a friend and as someone who has provided you with a means of income. What in the god's name are these, people? They don't look like any human nations I know. They don't even have a Slegion accent. Well they are definitely not some of those Black Knights of Harring Point I heard about. Luthier asked Iris. As your friend too, you have to listen to every word I am about to say. Everything I will say to you after I finish this sentence I is true. Iris emphasized. The vampire began to discuss to Luthier what had happened to her from the past days. She started with about how her normal day back in her old home where she was just minding her own business when suddenly she was attacked by the strange-looking soldiers. She managed to fight them off for a while but she was captured. She was taken to their ship where a kind young woman named Hannah introduced her to the UFE. Humans. She, alongside Kane showed her so many wonderful things about their world and in exchange for her stolen necklace that the U.F.E managed to obtain, she will become their guide to the world. She found out whilst during her absence her house was burnt down by the burning horse bandits due to not being there to protect it, and she has vowed vengeance from that point on that their leader, Devico will die a slow and painful death. So, they have your necklace. And you agreed to be their guide? I, I am surprised. These. New humans are strange indeed commented Luthia. Strange is an understatement. They got flying boats. Iris added. No way, like the steamships I had back in the mountain provinces. Luthia asked. Yes, but bigger. And can house thousands of people inside it. Iris said. Luthia backed away from Iris with his mouth agape. His thoughts, just like what Iris experienced beforehand couldn't fully grasp the words and concepts that he has heard. He dreadfully stared at both Samantha and Vincent who lay with the penal soldier staring back at him. You look like you saw a ghost. Vincent commented. Are they indeed true, what Iris saw? Are there more of you by the Verdon Valley Forest? How long were you there? Luthier asked taking a moment to pause between each sentence. Yes, and we were around about a week. Probably the craziest week of my, Sam's, maybe the Cockney, Kane, and Obed's life. First, there was the burning horse bandits who we fought off. 
Wait, you fought the burning horse bandits. Luthia interrupted. Yeah, killed a giant fire golem thingy that one of them summoned where we got Iris necklace from but we didn't know what it exactly it was. Back then, Vincent explained. How many tried to attack your camp? Luthier asked. From the body counts, about 150 give or take, plus that summoner guy and his pet, Vincent answered. I can't believe what I am about to say this, but you're a hero like the days of old. Luthier happily exclaimed. He walked up to Vincent and merrily shook his hands in euphoric gratitude. Ah. Thank you, rich small person. Is that a good thing? Vincent asked in confusion. As Iris has explained, the burning horse bandits are a plague upon our land. No one is brave enough to fight them. They got gold, goons, and guts to back themselves up. I heard they even blackmailed much of the TYRE and nobility to look the other way. But you, you fought back and shattered the illusion of their so-called untouchability, dot. Said Luthia. Intrigued, Vincent leaned closer to the dwarf. Samantha, who woke herself up to be able to hear what the dwarf merchant was telling. You could have a shot in hundred eons to take that bastard down. I am damn sure that if you do the entire principality a favor by taking down Devico and the burning horses, your people can be on the good side of everyone. Luthia said. How come? Samantha asked. Well Samantha did tell me your leaders are trying to understand what is happening and in my experience as a businessman, the first impression is the best impression which I am very sorry to say you didn't have because of them am I correct on this? Luthia asked. Indeed, Samantha answered. Well, I am a very well-connected man with a huge grudge against them. And anybody who isn't one of the burning horse bandits will gladly want to see them gone. If you can get inside Devico's compound and destroy all the blackmail material he has on everyone, he will be powerless to defend himself. The principality will be thankful, and you can have the peaceful first impressions your leaders had always wanted with an audience with Prince Clovich and to sweeten the deal, there's a 30,000 ducat bounty on Devico's arrest that no one was able to claim yet. Wait. I am getting ahead of myself, it's going to be heavily defended. Luthia said. He tapped his chin in a second thought when he realized he didn't think this through with what his plan was. Well, I can call Polonsky to send some men over to take him down. We too have an axe to grind with them. Samantha rebutted. Well, in that case, I can easily bribe the gate guards to look away while your soldiers get in red-haired. The merchant smiled. He snapped his fingers in delight in excited anticipation from the freedom from the menacing bandits who ransacked the principality for decades. I am going to think that you and Governor White are going to be the best of friends. Samantha smiled. A knock on the door interrupted them as a familiar voice spoke. Lieutenant? Are you in there, said the voice of Lewis Crocker. Yes come in, Samantha replied. Iris walked towards the door and pulled it open letting Crocker, Obedia, and Kane into the room. It's good to see you. How's is your magic bird thing working on? Iris said to Kane. Thanks, the survey was uneventful but I got all the data I need, Kane replied. Lewis walked up to Samantha's bed and knelt on her side whilst resting his weight on the butt of his LMG. You can still walk, right? How's the leg? Crocker asked. I can walk slowly by tomorrow at best. But I don't think I can go in a fi fight for a few days. I'll just be stuck being the field leader for the time being. By the way, Sarge, Obud, Mudwin, meet Luthia. Samantha said pointing at the pint-sized man next to the three new guests of the room. Woe are you, a dwarf? Obedia asked dumbfounded at what he is seeing. The name is Luthia Mirian, Tyrian's most famous businessman and a proud member of the dwarfen race. I and your friends were discussing a way to help you meet up with the prince who I believe your leaders would love to meet. And don't worry, Iris gave me all the details. Luthia said. Well, how? Crocker asked. You will need to do something for him first to grab his attention. The prince rarely leaves his castle unless he has a good reason to. Taking out a mutual enemy could lure him out for talks. Luthia cunningly explained his plan. Go on, I am liking this. Crocker smiled. 
You know the burning horse bandits? I believe you have already met them. If you take them oh you dash. Sign me up, in fact, sign everyone in the eardom up. We all want to give those buggers a taste of their own medicine. Crocker enthusiastically said. Count me in. Kane followed. For my family. Obedia followed forth. I love your enthusiasm. Luthier said as he ran to them and shaken the three happily. You can't fathom how everyone will be grateful when you do this, Luthier said. Take my word for it. Especially you Kane. Iris winked. So, what happens now? What's the plan? Crocker asked Samantha. I am going to have to make some calls. We are going to need some big guns for this. Samantha smiled. Already her head had several brave men she has in mind that will gladly take up arms to avenge those that had fallen those days ago, when they first arrived in Glyasia. Meanwhile back in the Eardom. Governor Jeremy White and Colonel Polonsky stood in front of a court of their peers in the U.F.E. government. They were just holograms but the virtual images excreted an aura of dismay and fury to the two as they had reported the news to their superiors about the attack on the ship earlier that week. So, not only were you were attacked in a supposedly empty planet with eight casualties, but you are also telling me that our initial probes on the planet were dead wrong? Asked U.F.E. Colonial Bureau Chairwoman. Yes, Madam Chairwoman. Our new findings have come up with completely contradictory data from Mudwin's survey readings. Instead of empty plains, the drone found sprawling farmlands and hamlets that dotted the landing zone's land. All inhabited mind you. Reports from both the postmortem of the dead hostiles who attacked us have us to believe that the natives who live here are, and by every way, human. As for the attack, we were completely off guard because we all thought we are going to land in an uninhabited world but thanks to the efforts of Colonel Polonsky and his colonial militia they managed to fort them off. Credits to Lieutenant Rose for taking down a giant fire golem. If it wasn't for her, we would have all been dead. Governor White said. Human aliens? Am I hearing that correctly? The chairwoman asked. Yes, they are human, same physiology and shape and size. Their technology levels, as observed by eyewitnesses are somewhere deemed in the late medieval to early renaissance technology judging by the clothes on their back and primitive weapons that they had wielded. Governor White answered. We have come to you chairwoman and members of the board to request additional resources from you. May I recommend extra firepower like new weapons and vehicles for my militia to work with? Suggested Colonel Polonsky. Due to several economic restrictions from our side colonel I don't think we can deliver you new hardware but I can attach a marine division from a naval amphibious carrier to escort the second wave of colonists. The investors have been getting reluctant to invest in the Benham 3 expedition. News of the attack has spread like wildfire and debates back in New York are arguing about the ethics of interacting with primitive natives, and the whole prime directive mumble the public hashtag in social media. The chairwoman said. Thank you, when we have additional data we will send it to you back in New York. This is Governor Jeremy White signing out. The governor said. The holograms disappeared leaving the two men in the holographic communications room alone. Governor White placed his hand on his forehead and sighed in relief. It was a scary predicament to go face to face with the judgmental big wigs of the UFE government, and he barely got out of the holographic conference with them. Damn it, the second wave won't arrive until next month. Jeremy frustratingly said. Calm down Jerry. We are doing as best as we could and the past is past. We mourn the dead and now we must persevere. My squads are already roaming the planet for intel and I am just as confused on why the probe's data was off. Right now, as a governor we need these colonists to be doing something useful for everyone. We can't just sit here and wait a month doing nothing. Those greenhouse farms aren't going to build themselves. Polonsky said taking charge of the situation. You are right. I will start rolling out the glass panes and frames now. Jeremy said snapping back from his near nervous breakdown. Colonel. We got a call from Lieutenant Rose. She has got some good news about the city of Tyrian and about those burning horse bandits, those people who attacked us. 
said a communications officer who barged inside the room. Finally, something good for a change. Give that radio to me. Polonsky said. He grabbed the radio, placed the stereo part of the device on his ear, and listened to Samantha's call. After explaining to him their plans on meeting Prince Klovich and how they can strike back at the burning horse bandits, Polonsky had only one phrase to respond to the green red-headed lieutenant. I shall marshal the men. He responded before turning down the radio.